thank you all for sticking with us. Um, you know, and uh, thank you, um, Marin and Sydney and Olivia, for those wonderful and insightful lectures. Um, we we now have the pleasure of uh, joining us. Celia Bertoya, who I mentioned before, uh, is uh, Harry Bertoya's youngest daughter and uh, the director and founder of the Harry Bertoya Foundation. And she has a, a background in real estate and fundraising and created the foundation in 2013. She wrote a wonderful biography uh, on, about her father called The Life and Work of Harry Bertoya, which came out in 2015. And she lectures internationally about her father and also does interviews all the time um, uh, speaking about Harry. Um, she's also a fine arts appraiser through the American Society of Appraisers, is qualified to issue certificates of authenticity and to appraise Bertoyas. Um, but, um, and so you can see we wanted to, uh, so please welcome, please <laughs> join me in welcoming Celia Bertoya. Um, so the, the, the idea, of course, was to have a range of perspectives in this conversation on Bertoya. Sydney is uh, uh, an expert on Bertoya's monotypes. Marin has a particular affinity for his engagement with architecture and architects. Um, Olivia obviously has a deep love and appreciation for the sounding sculptures. And, um, uh, and, and Celia knew Harry better than any of us. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so, you know, we, we've talked about these kinds of isolated elements of his practice. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we discuss in the exhibition is that, you know, these things overlapped all the time. And I'm curious, Celia, about, you know, how that manifested, manifested itself in kind of his daily life in the studio and, in, and, and with the family. Well, yeah, gosh, that's, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, Harry saw no boundaries between anything. Yeah. You know, he, he didn't like categories or labels. So his whole life was one. It was, it was wholesome, you know, it was, there weren't separations. So the conversation around the dinner table might include the latest art book that had just come out along with what happens after death and uh, what kind of tree should we get for uh, you know, a fruit tree. I mean, <laughs> and it all flowed seamlessly and seemed to work quite well. And I know even as a, a youngster, when we would travel, when, not travel, when we would visit the studio, when we'd go to the shop, and there's Harry, there's my dad working on some huge monumental piece. And I, I didn't really know what he was doing or the, the meaning of it or any of the scholarly, you know, but, I could tell just about just the way he would talk about his work and the the way he would touch them that he loved what he was doing and he was doing his life work he was right where he was supposed to be and looking back on it I got such a great education and example of how to live just by his actions and how, how he lived his life, uh, much more than any words he could ever say. Yeah, yeah, and I, sh I, should, also, um, I should also encourage our other panelists that, you know, if, if other, Sydney, you too, if other questions occur to you, please feel free to, to jump in and ask them. One of the, um, one of the, I think interesting things, and, and, and Marin mentioned it um, in her talk, was, um, was about the relationships that he had with um, you know, commissioners, collaborators, architects. Um, and it seems like also you know, the, the people who, who touched his life in, 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 a, in a myriad of ways um, 
I, I remember you talking in particular early on when we, when we came to visit you about his generosity. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I think we have, you know, works in the exhibition that were, um, you know, that, uh, you know, eventually ended up in, in museum collections, but that were given away essentially as gifts. Um, you tell us a little bit more about how he was, um, about, about that kind of aspect of, of generosity. Well, that's a great point to bring up because my father was incredibly generous and uh, that could be exemplified by how he treated his workers, his everyday helpers in the shop. He had two brothers, the Flanagan brothers, who worked for him for many years. And every Christmas, uh, he might give them a, a monetary Christmas bonus, but he would also allow them to choose a sculpture, anything of, of their liking. And uh, both of them acquired quite, quite a nice little collection <laughs> <laughs> that helped their widows much later. Uh, and again, as a child, I sort of didn't think that my dad had many friends because <laughs> we lived out in the boonies. We were out on a dirt road in the country, and we didn't have that many people come over for dinner or you know, parties or anything. But only much later, when I was researching the book and started going through all the archival letters, I realized that Harry's friends were all over the world. <laughs> and everyone and anyone who he worked with became a friend. Mm -hmm. And I think as, as Bennett in the audience could attest to, he affected people. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he was such a, a generous, kind spirit, as along with being very powerful, you know, when Harry was mad, you knew it. <laughs> but he affected people with his, his generosity of spirit to the point where these letters, I mean, a, a Knoll dealer who would sell a few Bertoia sculptures here and there and, and never take a commission, by the way, they would make the check out to Harry Bertoia. Uh, they would write a letter saying, Harry, we just, we love your furniture, we love your sculptures. We love you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was so sweet and such a revelation to me to realize that people felt very warmly about him. And like you said, he, he was donating to museums, uh, the local charities, you know, the Reading Hospital, and you know this outfit and that outfit. He, he would give them a sculpture for their annual silent auction. And he never talked about that at home. I only mm -hmm. discovered that reading through the, the correspondence later. Mm -hmm. So he was a great guy and uh, very generous. Yeah. Is there anything that you think that either today or with the exhibition or um, the work that we've been doing on the show that we haven't covered about Bertoy that you want people to know about? <sighs> wow. Um, Throwing softballs at you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's great. But yeah, I, I asked them, well, how should I prepare for this uh, round table discussion? <laughs> oh, no, you don't have uh, just, just talk about your dad. And I love to do that, so it's not a problem. Uh, I would say that, oh, boy, while... Harry never verbally expressed love. Uh, and as his daughter, honestly, I don't remember him ever saying the words, I love you, but I knew I was loved. I just felt it from him. Uh, he would take the time to sit down and talk to me about important issues. Uh, we would have these lovely little father-daughter moments when he was older and he was kind of looking like a hippie with his hair long. <laughs> I became his, his 
hair cutter. <laughs> so if I was off at college or wherever and I only came home after six months, his hair was pretty long. But we'd sit out in the lawn and I'd cut his hair and we would just talk about life. So even though perhaps he didn't come to school functions very often or was the, the normal American dad, he really was a fantastic parent and husband, even though Brigitta was always number two. You know, his art was his passion, and she had to accept that position. But he truly was a family man, and even some of the things that he said, once he knew he had terminal cancer, I'm talking about the overview of his life, he, the, the, the family meant a lot to him. It was, he felt it was extremely important that he had left these wonderful children. And <laughs> yeah, so just a good guy all around. Yeah. Um, Sydney, the, uh, you know, the, the monotypes are an element of his practice that, um, you know, I think your talk got us up through 1945, maybe a little later, 1950, but it's something that he did throughout the rest of his life. And I, I, I'm wondering if you notice um, in your, you know, in your studies of, of the monotypes, how that, that practice progressed um, as, as time went by. That's a great question. So, and I think you'll see this a little bit in the exhibition, um, which I'm experiencing vicariously through the catalog <laughs> and the checklist. Um, he really starts to use it as a place to sketch and imagine sculpture, but not in a kind of one-to-one. -one. So he might have sketched a sculpture that he wouldn't realize for two decades after um, he first put it to paper. So I think it became a place for him to imagine um, sculptural form and space. Um, he often inserted little figures and notes about different techniques. So you have a sense that he's imagining a whole environment or atmosphere and ambiance. Um, in some ways, I think, anticipating his work in sound. Um, so I think that the sculpture, the monotypes become um, more experimental, but in the service of sculpture um, and the way he would express himself in metal. And I just think it's worth pausing. It is such a bizarre way to sketch, um, to, to sketch in a medium where you cannot see what you're doing. <laughs> you're, you're seeing a vague image of it through a dampened sheet of paper. That's unusual. Um, I don't think that most sculptors, most artists sketch blindly in that way. Um, and it, it says something about the way that he worked in metal as well. There was a kind of feeling to it and uh, um, that the process of making, the process of doing was the way that he was learning and um, experimenting and, and finding, feeling his way to a result. Yeah, um, I mean, that was, I think, something that that is a kind of red thread that winds itself through his career is that that very kind of um, the experimentation that he did in, in any you know that that he would um, turn to in, in, in any aspect of, of his work um, that sense of, of you know um, moving towards something intuitively um, and almost a sense of uh, you know a sense of play you know, to find out what material, what what mat certain materials will do, find out um, where something is leading him, um, and and I'm I'm curious to to know if um, I mean that's that's clearly I think something that um, that comes out in a lot of the work. I mean, is that is that something that that you see happening as well um, in terms of you know the way that he practiced that kind of that kind of sense of play. Mm. Yes, uh, but I, I wanted to mm -hmm. tag on to something Sydney said about that technique. It's rather unusual. 
And he, he wrote a brief paragraph about that in the 50 Drawings book. And to paraphrase, it said something like, uh, he, he loved that technique because uh, he didn't use his eyes you know, for visual, it was, it was more he was getting the creative spirit and bypassing the intellect. Mm -hmm. And if he did it quickly enough, it would shoot out his hands and <laughs> poof, there's, there's his drawing. Uh, I always loved that. And that, that was part of the reason that he didn't sign his works either. He felt his creativity came from a divine source and he didn't want to put just one man's name on there. Of course, that creates a few problems for those of us who follow. But, yeah. uh, and as far as the, the playfulness and the experimentation, uh, I would say Harry, or the, the man I knew was, I didn't see his playful side all that much. Uh, I think. I think his friends or someone like Bill Springer may have seen his playful side. I know when, when my sister uh, met Peter, who, who became the father of her daughter, he did this fun thing, which you've probably all done, where he took a $50 bill, pulled it out of his pocket as if he just had it perfectly waiting for that moment. <laughs> and he said, okay, we're gonna see how sharp your reactions are. And you know, he holds it up here, <laughs> Peter's down here, and, and he drops the $50 bill. And normally, no one can catch it because it happens so fast. <laughs> but Peter was a pretty sharp guy, and he managed to catch the $50 bill, which allowed him to keep it and also to date Lesta. <laughs> but back to the, the sculptural experimentation, when he had an idea, especially for the, the commissions, the, uh, the architectural pieces, he, he would get a sense of what was needed for that space and and the theme of that building and what the architect and the client were looking for. And so he had this vision in his mind and perhaps he did not yet know the technique mm -hmm. by which to make that. Well, impossible was not a word he used. He would just experiment until he, he figured out how to make it. And with the, the Dulles mm -hmm. spill cast, that was an experimentation process that really went on for about a year. And the final construction all happened within 24 hours. Yeah. So yeah, there, there was a lot of experimentation. And I think some of his smaller pieces and after hours pieces were very experimental and sometimes transitional you know, going from uh, the early kind of rough and rugged sunbursts mm -hmm. like that Brussels tree to the more refined and elegant dandelions and all the steps in between. Mm -hmm. So yeah, experimentation was, was big on the list. Yeah, and I mean that's something that, that comes up in your practice as well, Olivia. You know, this idea, this sense of um, responding in the moment intuitively, experimenting, not knowing what the end result might be. Yeah. And, I, and I think that was something that was also important in his experience of the, of the sound sculptures and, and his engagement with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. The sound sculptures, and as you can see with the samples, they come in all different shapes and sizes and the cylinder heads and the cattails and the reed, different metals, different alloys. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a, a very long experimental process of starting when he first stumbled upon this concept in, around 1960 all the way up until his death. Uh, and I know that he, he wasn't really finished. He would have liked to have continued with that. 
How did he stumble onto it? I mean, I know kind of the origin story, but I'm curious if you know more about that. Yeah. Well, the story goes that it, he was working on a small wire piece, and the, he was bending one of the wires, and somehow it broke off and flipped through the air and was, you know, I hear different versions, but maybe it was even making noise as it flipped through the air. And then, of course, it landed somewhere and made more noise. So even though he, he had worked around metals all his life, he, he was a metals man, and he had probably heard those sounds many times. Some, something clicked, and he wondered, gosh, what, if, that, if one rod sounds like that, what would 10 or 20 or 100 mm -hmm. rods sound like? And that, that began the process. <laughs> <laughs> and we should underscore, I think, too, um, that each one of those tonals, each one of those singing bars, each one of those gongs is unique. Right? It's always different configurations, different metals, different tops. Um, and, and you know, when we talk about thousands of unique works, I mean, we really do mean it. Like, everything mm -hmm. was handmade by him. <laughs> like, this is the other thing I think when we especially get into, like, later 60s, early 70s sculpture, you know, there's a lot of kind of outsourcing yeah. of fabrication. Um, and there's a lot of repetition that starts to happen. And you kind of get into certain styles. And, like, everything that you see upstairs is a result of Bertoia's hand. Um, and, and I think that's also a really pretty remarkable thing, especially when looking at his contemporaries, so. Yeah, mm -hmm. very much. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, you talk about the Flanagan brothers, you know, being kind of consistent helpers in the studio. You know, for the really big projects, did he, did he pull in others? To help or, okay, yeah, so, or, or was it just the three of them? I mean, that would. Well, early on, uh, yeah, there was a whole progression with that. He actually had Brigitta mm. in the shop <laughs> way early on, and that wasn't so good. <laughs> so, and then he got Jim Flanagan fairly early. Uh, Bill was at around 1960 or somewhere in there. Yeah, and so Jim Flanagan was there first, and he became very familiar with all the, so all the works he had done up to that point, well, he did have various helpers here and there, uh, but then Jim became very consistent, and soon they pulled in Ed, the brother, and uh, then later on, you know, when I was more cognizant of what was going on, mm -hmm. Uh, he would hi hire some of my friends. Mm. You know, I had a, a boyfriend, Bill. He hired him, <laughs> and then my, my my other friend's husband. He he worked for him for a while. So there were times where he had four or five helpers, uh, and and then Val, my brother, worked there for about seven years. So yeah, he did have help. But Harry did all the design, you know, he lined everything out. And uh, I had a chance to interview Ed Flanagan before he passed. And he was telling me that they would do the, the rote work of, you know, some of the bushes. You can imagine all those branches, just mm -hmm. tedious Gosh. work. Yeah. Yeah. But that Harry, would have to do the final uh, branches because, as you can imagine, here's this huge, or a dandelion, you know, you've got three quarters of it, and then your, your hole to get those branches <laughs> in there is getting smaller and smaller. And, and Harry had these humongous <laughs> farmer hands. <laughs> How he did this detail work, and Ed said that there were some things that only Harry could do, yeah. because he really became a, a master welder. And I actually heard from a, a Noel gal who had apparently taken a welding class in California, and she's the only one I've ever heard it from, so it hasn't been corroborated, but she said they, in, in her class, they actually taught the Bertoia weld because it was this elegant and beautiful weld. I mean, you look at, 
for example, a bridge or uh, raft or steel rafters, mm -hmm. and you see this kind of clunky mm -hmm. welding. But Harry's work was just smooth and beautiful and elegant. Mm. Yeah. The the other thing that I'm, you know, I'm curious about because, you, you know, you you hear the sounding sculptures now. And, and there are a number of ways in which we wanted to, you know, bring that, that sonic presence into the exhibition. And one, one of which, of course, is, is Olivia's mm -hmm. collaboration with them. The other is that we'll, we're very great, um, Celia has very graciously allowed us to demonstrate them yeah. on a regular basis. So she's trained our visitor experience staff on, on how to play them. Um, and so visitors will, will be able to hear them and not just you know, see them kind of standing mutely in the gallery. And then the other way, um, and again, this is um, thanks to Celia, she, she recognizes that you know, Harry meant for these things to, be, to, be, to continue to be used and to continue to be played by artists and musicians to continue to explore their potential. And, uh, and so we've, we've um, organized a, a concert series where um, you know, some of the you know, most prominent um, experimental musicians uh, are six nights in February, the 22nd through the 28th, coming to Dallas and will play uh, the, the sounding sculptures as well as their own instruments. And so it'll be a, a way for that experimentation to continue in the present. Um, Great improvisers too, so they'll know, like they'll, the way that they will approach those instruments will be really interesting. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. they're so in, into the flow of uh, improvisation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, and, and, you know, and, and, and actually when we were speaking with Bill earlier, you know, what, what was that experience like in, you know, to have all of these things in a barn, mm -hmm. essentially, and you know, have all of that resonant wood around you. You know, it's yeah. a lot of people talk about it as this kind of physical experience. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, it it really is almost indescribable. But but the closest I can offer is that uh, entering the barn was like entering another realm, <laughs> and. Uh, and Harry always took his shoes off in order to be quiet and not interfere with the voices of the, the tonal sculptors. And he would perhaps say a few words about, it's not really music, but this is an earthly experience. And, uh, and people would sit in the Bertoia chairs. <laughs> and then Harry, very instinctually would begin to play in the beginning softly and perhaps choosing some of the more gentle sculptures and a complete silence. <laughs> he didn't talk, no one in the audience talked and no, no matter what, what people came in with or, or me as a teenager, you know, oh, I have a test tomorrow, or you know, whatever <laughs> nonsense. Uh, all that just melted away. You, you were there in the present moment, and Harry is doing his thing, and he sort of slinked around like a cat almost. <laughs> and, and he knew the sculptures so well. And he, would, he had them grouped in uh, little families mm -hmm. where it was, there was a variety, you know, maybe a, a cylinder top and a, an inconel. And so he could get all the different sounds that he wanted. You know, and sometimes I thought that he probably knew those sculptures better than he knew us children. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just playing and, and then, you know, this might take, 20 minutes at the most, but soon more and more sounds, and as they don't really end, you play them and it keeps going, mm -hmm. and you plunk the singing bars, 
and you sort of forget about them, but then all of a sudden you hear another little sound there, and the noise is building, and, and soon it was this cacophony of, oh, whoo. <laughs> and here you've got this thick wooden floor, this remodeled old Pennsylvania Deutsch barn, and there was a whole level underneath it, so it was essentially a sound box underneath oh, the Sonambian barn. Wow. Okay. And huh. here you're sitting in the chair and you start to feel the vibrations through the floor. Oh, wow. So yeah, your, your body's feeling it and the, the sound and the visuals, they're all swaying and <laughs> dancing. And Harry, oh, it's just <laughs> this whole experience. And then at the very end, he'd probably hit the the ten foot gong, which was just completely thunderous, mm -hmm. and you're just reeling. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then okay, Harry stops. He sits down, and we listen to the sculptors talking for another few minutes, mm -hmm. and everyone's sort of just being with their experience, a kind of sighing and wow, <laughs> uh, really just uh, otherworldly uh, music of the spheres. I don't know, you can throw a lot of words out there, but it was something that once you had experienced it, you would never forget it. Yeah. And Harry, of course, was the best performer, although he didn't like to use that word, but <laughs> he knew those sculptures so well uh, I've heard other people playing them, and even when I play them, no one really connected with them as well as Harry did, but it, it was quite an experience. And I think Olivia's installation there is perhaps as close as you can come to pretending that you're in the barn. Mm -hmm. And the recordings, and we have a lot of the Sunambient recordings, they're, they're pretty good too, and sometimes I'll do a meditation to them. Mm -hmm. And they, they range, I mean, some of them are very gentle and healing, and some are just wild and chaotic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've got everything and all in between. Now I have to admit, I, I uh, listened to the Synambient recordings while I was writing the, uh, my essay for the catalog. Yeah. <laughs> it, really, it really gets you into the kind of that focused space of, of Harry's world. Mm -hmm. um, at least it did for me. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I also uh, want to open it up to you all. Like we can think of a hundred questions, <laughs> but I, I do want to open it up to you all to, to ask questions. And, and if, if you wouldn't mind, um, uh, we'll, we'll call on you. And then Lindsay and, and Anna have, have microphones and if you could just wait to ask a question until you grab the microphone, because otherwise, Sydney is not going to be able to hear you at all. <laughs> and also, we're not, you know, we're, we're recording this so that other people will be able to, to watch it later. Uh, Paul, did you want to ask a question? Thanks. Yeah, first of all, a, a wonderful panel and a wonderful exhibition. Uh, I want to ask about a, another Harry from the field of experimental music. That's right, yep. Elizabeth. Yeah, Parch. yeah, Harry Parch. Yeah. Uh, Parch wrote Genesis of a Music in the late 1940s. So this had been on the table for a while. And what would help me to better appreciate the instruments and sounds, and Olivia makes a very important distinction between music and sound. And I know that the differences between Parch and Bertoia are way more than the similarities. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to understand how the aural ideas of Bertoia are grounded in the experimental music movement, which was already underway. Yeah. That, that's my question, so that's for anybody. 
Yeah, if I could kind of riff on that question, I would. Yeah, that's a you the question. Same, <laughs> Please. Like, well, no, it's yeah. a question for you actually, okay. um, because I was wondering how. I mean, I almost get the sense that that he was kind of just like on his own track and like just didn't really pay attention or even care about sort of like what was happening in contemporary music post John Cage, who was like a big force. But I was wondering like if he did know about Harry Parch or John Cage or, or any of these figures which were basically happening kind of similar time period. Well, he, he was, I don't know specifically if he knew about Harry Parch, but I know he was interested in John Cage mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, he, he did keep abreast of uh, pop culture and what was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember him seeing Bruce Springsteen on the cover of Time magazine and he, <laughs> he gave me some money and he said, go out and buy his album. I want to hear this guy's <laughs> music. Um, but he, he was really on his own track mm. and Sydney just like with the monotypes he, he didn't really collaborate with other printmakers mm. he kind of just got it from who knows where and I think that was the same with the music now uh, we have Aresta's daughter here Aresta was very instrumental in the the sound aspect of Harry's sculpture because Oresta was a musician, a self-taught musician, but he actually wrote classical music. He was pretty incredible. And by the way, also- It's, it's Harry's older brother, Oresta. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, Harry's yeah. older brother. He, he pretty much sacrificed his own musical talents to help Harry in his, his life. And he said, you know, Harry, you're the, you're the guy with the talent, mm. go for it. Uh, but it was Aresta who suggested, when he f saw the first mm -hmm. sounding sculptures, okay. he said, oh, let's uh, put these all together and make an orchestra of mm -hmm. sorts. Yeah. And then it just developed from there. And I think the early ones, you know, we've tried to trace what, what exactly happened, because he, he would bring a couple of the sounding sculptures up to Detroit where Aresta was, and then Odresta would play around with them and he might uh, chop off a few inches okay. and see That's how that sounded. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so lots of experimentation. Mm. So in a sense, like, it sounds like the, the sculpture was built. So maybe in, in a way this would be the difference between the two Harrys is that I get the sense that Harry Parch was very mathematical about his designing of the mm. tonal parts of his pieces because of course like the measurements of each piece is got, is, corresponds with a different harmony and a dif different tone, whereas based on what you're saying now, it sounds like almost like there was a prototype and it was built and then it was tuned almost, like by, as you say, like taking off an inch or two here and listening to, which makes actually a lot of sense given the complexity of, and the kind of like non-scale-like um, sense of, of those instruments, because it's just, the harmonics mm -hmm. are so complex, it's almost like not as uh, mathematical as a Harry Parch instrument. You know? And I think through materials too, right? Absolutely. I think there's this sense where, you know, one of the things that's really interesting to me about like the Standard Oil Commission, which kind of got drowned out by its architecture in a lot of ways. It was in a, a large reflecting pool that had fountains around it that have now been ripped out. Um, but there's a lot of correspondence where like Bertoy is trying to figure out exactly what type of granite base to use, what like rubber gaskets to put underneath, mm -hmm. how thick the brass plate should be, how thick the rod should be to get the sound that, that he really was looking for. So it, it was kind of like sound, but, but the material yeah. was the crucial um, piece in the equation. And, and the other thing I could think to you in terms of context is that there are two fairly significant sound sculpture exhibitions that occur in the 70s. Um, one is at, uh, Sydney, you might know this off the top of your head too, I think it's at the Wadsworth Athenaeum um, in the 70s. It's in Connecticut. So I think it might be Wadsworth Athenaeum and then the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, there's two like pretty significant wow. um, sound art, sound sculpture shows uh, where Bertoia is showing alongside some of those, you know, kind of experimental sound art pioneers stretching from the mid-century. So he would have been aware 
um, of other other figures and you know showed his work would have been shown alongside of those um, in the 70s. That's very interesting. Um, we'll go here first. Uh, I think Anna's coming with a microphone, Bill. <laughs> uh, thank you. I I uh, I'm thinking of the times in which I heard uh, Harry in his barn. And that was mostly later in his life and towards the end of his life. And I, kn I always felt there, was, uh, there were elements of uh, orchestration mm -hmm. in the work. Mm -hmm. And I wondered whether you would comment, uh, especially Celia, whether or not there was orchestration early on, which relates to the comment earlier mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. concerns whether it's just sound uh, or random sound, and as opposed to orchestration. Well, that's that's a good question. Uh, honestly, I don't really know, but my my intuitive guess is that uh, he didn't think about it ahead of time. He wouldn't plan out any. Okay, this one's going to be this is kind of theme, but. Uh, he, re he really went by instinct and, and he, he always made the point that it wasn't music, it wasn't a concert, and he was not a performer. And there was a lot of randomness. I mean, again, I'm not sure if he really thought about that, but, you know, there was... I, I rarely have heard in his recordings any kind of one, two, three, one, <laughs> two. You know, there there wasn't a rhythm like that, and in fact, sometimes the sounds are surprising. All of a sudden, you hear this, the singing bars or a gong when you didn't quite expect it. So, I think that he went by feel, although on the other hand. He, he was scientifically minded as well as artistically and creatively minded. Uh, he would talk about uh, the, the hertz and the, you know, the tensile strength mm -hmm. of the metals and, and, and even in, in packing, uh, you know, one of his helpers was telling me how he was packing the standard oil pieces. <laughs> And it was this 40-foot flat flatbed, and he puzzled it out how each crate, you, know, you had to put this one this way and this one this way, yeah. <laughs> and he had this whole diagram. So when the driver, the truck driver, came, he said, "Okay, this is what we have to do." Right. <laughs> um, so back to your question, I don't think it was really planned out or orchestrated. But the finished product would sort of feel like it was orchestrated because he was going with the flow mm -hmm. so beautifully. And, he, and I think he did talk about in interviews that um, uh, it's, not, it's not something that, you know, these things, you can't, they're kind of, you can't repeat a composition. Right. Um, because you can't, there's no, there's no kind of form of notation that, you know, yeah, um, a musician might might take from um, you know a composition by uh, a, a, another composer and be able to play it, um, you know, because it it, it was uh, it and so it was more freeform. Mm -hmm. um, but it's I, I remember like the, him talking about that. And I'm I'm wondering though, like, and just kind of going off of what you were saying about like how he grouped the instruments, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that maybe the orchestration was actually in the grouping kind of timbrally. Mm. Like, and I think, mm. I think timbre is a word that's important when we discuss things like this because timbre is a word that's actually used in music, but really all timbre means is sound. It's like the overtone structure of a sound, something that makes the tone characteristically metal or wood or something mm. like that. Mm. And it seems like my, feeling is like he was probably timbrally kind of aware of how he was grouping these these pieces because they are so timbrally different. I mean, mm -hmm. some are like white noise. You just like, the, the rods are so small, you know, that you mm -hmm. just hit them, it's like a wave, mm -hmm. yeah. an ocean wave. And so I'm wondering if like his score, in a sense, was just like the 
the actually like the formation of the instruments in the space. Like he mm -hmm. kind of knew how to move through like what you were saying, but it wasn't like notated mm -hmm. like that. It was just like the spatial notation of the room mm -hmm. and the pieces maybe. Well, one thing I found interesting was at the MAD Museum, uh, Museum of Arts and Design in 2016, they had several musicians come in and work with the sculptures. And uh, they did try to compose music. And I mean, it, it was interesting and I'm glad that happened, but to me, it felt kind of stilted mm -hmm. and it, it didn't quite have the free flow and freedom mm -hmm. that Harry originally had. I mm. could see that. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to really play those. They play you. Like you're, you, yeah. they, they <laughs> kind of tell you, like you can't approach them as like a percussionist would or something mm. like that. Because when you do that, it's like you're just getting like, a, if you use a mallet or something, you're just getting a tiny little piece of what that, what that piece could actually do mm -hmm. if you were just like activating the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense that you would hear that, mm -hmm. that difference. Yes. Uh, Bennett. <laughs> Behind you, Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that, uh, you know, you talked about the uh, Standard Oil mm -hmm. uh, building and uh, Ed Edward Stone did, and uh, it's still there. <laughs> it's been changed a little bit through the years, but anyway, it's this 80-story vertical uh, building which is just all vertical yeah. and when Harry decided to do what he did uh, it was so perfect mm -hmm. for I mean talk about a collaboration mm -hmm. and then to have it destroyed by somebody coming in and mm -hmm. saying well now we've gone to Aon Center and so you know and on and on there are still remnants there and so forth thank thank heavens but anyway but no, and maybe everybody in the audience knows the story but talk about how Harry, on a moment, with a situation like that, I think you know Lady Bird Johnson was at the dedication, <laughs> along with the mayor and uh, the Swargans and so forth and so on, and uh, all, and here it was, the Windy City <laughs> with no wind. <laughs> <laughs> and Harry decided, well, what was appropriate for the occasion? He took his shoes and socks off, rolled up his pants, and waded into the water and played the instrument. <laughs> so, to me, that's Harry. <laughs> yeah, agreed. I think in a red turtleneck, too. Thank you. Very chic. <laughs> yeah. um, Lindsay, just back there. I, you've had your hand up a number of times. Sorry. Um, thank you. I just had a question, two quick questions for Ms. Bertoya. First of all, how did he start out to become interested in working with metal is one question. And the second is, you had all these wonderful works in the barn out back. Did any of his work make its way into the house or did the artist's family go without art? <laughs> 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 Great Good questions. Uh, the metal, the affinity for metal came early on. Even when Harry was a child in Italy, he would take something like the egg basket, uh, this wire mess, and make it into a sculpture. <laughs> 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 and uh, then when he came to Detroit and he had a chance, even in the, the schools before the Cranbrook, he learned metal smithing and he just, he loved metal. It was something inborn in him. Who knows, maybe he had a past life as an Egyptian metal smith or something. Yeah. But he loved metal, and the more he worked with it, the more he loved it. And he became so familiar with all the alloys. He worked with a, a metal supplier in California, this man Clarence Hawk, and he would he would have him create special alloys mm. just for Harry. Mm. You know, he found, well, maybe the beryllium copper, maybe he wanted a little more beryllium in there or mm. something. 
and Clarence worked with him and ended up with some lovely gifts of sculptures in return. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was early on, it seemed like it was just inside him. Mm -hmm. And as far as the, the sculptures, were they in the house? Well, we lived in a, uh, a very old farmhouse built in the 1750s with those thick stone walls. So it was this interesting mixture of Pennsylvania farmhouse and then inside, Bertoia chairs <laughs> and, really cool. and Florence Knoll couch <laughs> and Nakashima kitchen table. And, uh, and his sculptures were all over the property. Uh, you'd, you'd walk through the woods and all of a sudden here's, the, here's a Bertoia. <laughs> and, and some of them would get overgrown with bushes. <laughs> Wow. And interestingly enough, uh, one of his workers, Sam, uh, I guess he didn't need him in the shop for a little while, so he had him cleaning up some of the grounds and cutting away weeds and whatnot. And Sam came upon uh, three little sculptures that were completely buried in the bushes. <laughs> And he thought he was doing Harry a big favor, and he, you know, he cut them loose and, and uh, brought them back to the studio. And for a moment, Harry was furious, and he said, "What? You, you removed these from yeah. their spot?" <laughs> <laughs> and he, then he sort of recovered himself, and he said to Sam, "Well, which of the three do you like?" And Sam picked one, and. He gave it to him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, that is the one on the table where there's a cube, and then there's uh, another wow. piece. Of that, that's the one that was buried in oh. the bushes. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but uh, we didn't have a lot of sculptures in the house. It was a, a kind of stark, really. And Harry's bedroom was very stark, almost like a the room of a monk, mm -hmm. you know, just a very simple bed, uh, a, a table where he did some paperwork, and no curtains, mm -hmm. uh, really simple. And then, of course, Brigitte's room was full of Persian pillows and candles <laughs> and all kinds of fun little things. And that's where the girls would go to have girls' night. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, in the back here. Hi, thank you again for a great exhibition and, and a great panel. Um, I wanted to bring uh, another question back to the sculptures. Uh, I was familiar with so many of the standard type of sculptures that I know is Bertoia, but was happy and uh, just sort of elated to see these sculptures that were hanging. Hmm. Um, my question is, they're not really mobiles. How did he describe them, and why would he, what was his impression of them? Because in my mind, talking about forms in space, that's sort of like the ultimate thing, <laughs> especially since they move and they change. Uh, so I'm just curious about the background of what was the impetus to do those. Um. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were also pretty blown away, I think, installing those yeah. just to see how much they spin and turn. And I mean, I think like the first few days we were up, we were just like, they just look so different from every angle and from every lighting. And, um, and the short answer is that uh, the, the three we have upstairs, uh, two of them would be technically considered clouds and one would be a straw, but also maybe a straw cloud. I don't know. Right, right. The categories are fluid. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, they were referred to as clouds. Um, and actually in the, the catalog, Jed has a really lovely photo of, um, uh, I don't know if it was at the studio or at, at I think it was home. I over the pond. Over I think it was the over pond. the pond. Yeah, yeah, behind, yeah, the, yeah. behind the barn. Um, suspended up. So, I mean, they always were intended, you know, they yeah. were made to be suspended. Yeah, no, and actually that, that was, a, those photos that you have are fantastic. And, I, and they're, I, they're part of the, the catalog now. Um, but just to, to see, uh, so the, there's one kind of multi-plane construction cloud that ha it's hanging above the big, long 
platform um, uh, towards the street. And there are photographs of that that Harry took or had someone take looking up at it outside and you have clouds passing by and you know the, the sunlight is glinting off of the, the planes of the construction and then, and then there are others where it's kind of suspended out over the pond in, in the back um, and you're seeing it, it, it reflected in, in the pond, in the water of the pond and, and and you also see the sky above it. And so it's this kind of elision of both earth and water and sky um, where um, it kind of takes on the form of, well, maybe this is like a s small school of fish that's mm -hmm. swimming in the water or, you know, you don't, you don't really know what it is. It, it, it's just its own <laughs> thing, but it's clearly of nature and part of nature. Um, and um, I, think, I think the other, the other um, aspect to it is that, you remember that uh, photo I showed, the Herbert Matter photo of um, the Bertoia chairs and then the frames that are kind of suspended. So that, he would suspend the, the, the frames in order to weld them up, um, you know, because he's using bending wires and then he's connecting them in this kind of um, uh, uh, matrix. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a three-dimensional volumetric matrix, and so the way that he would work on them was he'd, he'd get it started, and then he'd suspend it, and then he'd be able to turn it and, and make the tack welds for the wires. And so mm -hmm. he was, you know, used to seeing these, these kinds of objects suspended in space, and I think the, the kind of cloud sculptures came out of, of, that, of that experience. Um, I'm, I'm speculating entirely, but I wouldn't be surprised. And also, I would say too, um, on the the wall upstairs in Gallery One, um, there's early two pieces. There's like a lead and silver, really fine wire in a vitrine case, and then right next to it, um, the the maquette for a conceptual sculpture, which kind of looks like a chair. And both of those pieces are balancing, right? All of those little elements. So the even like the big kind of triangular piece, it just balances on a little stand. Mm -hmm. And then all of the the fine wires in the landscape fantasy are all balancing too. And so a lot of those early, the early sculptures when he's transitioning or working alongside the chair development, there is a lot about balance mm -hmm. and suspension. So even if it has a stand, mm -hmm. um, there really is some thought there. Again, a kind of like engineering mind going on mm -hmm. um, in terms of physics. So I think it's a natural kind of um, next step to be like, ooh, if I'm balancing on a little stand, let's balance it up top. And then you think about the gongs being suspended and there's some really beautiful large commissions that are suspended dandelions or hemisphere shape. Um, so he, I think that's also speaking to the fact of like, where can I put sculpture, right? <laughs> can I stand it? Can I hang it? Can I affix it to a wall? Can I make it out of a wall? Um, so there, there really is a way too of not just thinking about materials or different techniques, but also, also different presentation models um, for different spaces. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, there was another question over here. Do you, do you still have a question? Okay, Anna, yeah, just um, this, the uh, lady right here in the white sweater. Thank you. I was interested in the reference to correspondence between Bertoia and the Nashers. I'm interested in uh, what uh, pieces of work they might have acquired and if they're going to be in the exhibit upstairs. Yeah, so um, uh, they acquired a few works by Bertoia over the years and like a lot of collectors in Dallas, they, they bought them through the Knoll showroom here. Um, it, there, so um, uh, actually, the one, the, um, one of the, the sunburst sculptures, right when you walk in the kind of main gallery, the, um, the one on the right is, um, it's also the, uh, the image of the catalog cover. Uh, it's kind of our main, but that's, that, that was something that the Nashers bought in the, I think, 1960s. Yeah, wow. yeah. 60s. Um, and there's yeah. also some fun correspondence too, uh, which happened a lot actually with, with Bertoia pieces, yeah. with private collectors and with bigger commissions. Um, correspondence about like, oh, something has broken. <laughs> <laughs> Can you help us? <laughs> How do we fix this? And he would also very graciously have works sent back to the studio in Pennsylvania and he'd fix it and then send it back <laughs> or instruct mm -hmm. people like, maybe don't put that one outside or here's a solution for that. And so there's some, some fun correspondence along those lines mm -hmm. too. Yes, sir. 
and, and has come in there with Mike. First of all, thank you for putting together a really a, an excellent exhibition of his work, pieces we've never seen or probably will never get an opportunity to see again. So it's a real treat. Um, I, I think what drew us to Batoya early on is most art hangs on the wall and says, look, but don't touch. And his pieces say, come and touch. <laughs> <laughs> but don't touch. <laughs> <laughs> Not here. No, don't touch yes. <laughs> so while the sambiance uh, and the gongs are obvious, how about the other pieces, the, you know, our kids play with the dandelion and the willows and the bush shapes, because they all make sounds. Seal, did your dad ever expect those to be touched and moved and played with? Or were those <laughs> don't touch? Well, Aaron, you might know. <laughs> I'm not a museum person, so <laughs> I don't know if I could answer that. But uh, Harry was always a little bit frustrated when he would see those do not touch signs at his exhibitions. But uh, actually, the dandelions are not really meant to be touched. They're just beautiful to gaze upon. Uh, the bushes do make some interesting sounds, uh, but I, I better, I better yeah. let Zed no, address no, it's true. that. And, and actually, this is something that it, <laughs> I, I think is common among a number of artists, um, that they love when people engage with their work. and. Um, and when they come to museums, which are dedicated to preserving that work for, you know, generations upon generations upon generations, that becomes problematic. And so, you know, artists often say that, you know, museums are where art goes to die. Um, <laughs> because there, you know, there, there are these kinds of prohibitions about touching and that's to, to preserve them, but, you know, maybe they're, maybe we're really you know, embalming them in a way. So, you know, it's always, it, it's always a fine balance. Um, and, you know, because these things are coming to us from, they're, they're not ours, you know, and, and we have to, um, you know, take, take good care of them. So uh, we do have lots of do not touch signs in our <laughs> galleries. Um, um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think a lot of times artists um, uh, regret that aspect of, of the kind of the loss of intimacy between yeah. you know the viewer and the work when it when it when it's shown in a museum and uh, go ahead uh, I will mention too that Harry did of course encourage people to, to touch the tonals and experience them and even little kids and he, he even enjoyed it we always had cats around the place, and sometimes the cats would sneak into the barn, <laughs> oh, no. and they, they'd walk through the aisles, and maybe their tail would play <laughs> oh as both their, and he loved that. Yeah. He thought that was just charming. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, and I, I mean, I would say too, also like some of my favorite photos, you know, like obviously working on the catalog Raisonne, we get all sorts of interesting archival photos of, of people's work. And uh, some of my favorite photographs are the ones of like, you know, really seeing how people live with their sculpture um, and that it really becomes, uh, you know, like Stanley Marcus for, for, for Dallas people, that will be a very common name. And, um, you know, Stanley Marcus had like a, a, a straw piece that was in his fireplace, it was like a fireplace grate, wow. you know, um, and uh, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. Or I'll get like, not as a curator or as an art historian, but just as like a human being, I'll get emails from, from collectors and they'll be like, well, our work's kind of in bad shape because the grandkids just love it. And like, <laughs> part of me just loves that, you know? Like, I love that these are things that feel familiar and feel like they're part of, again, everyday lives instead of it being like, oh, well, we have it on a pedestal and nobody ever touches it. And like, even the bun chefs, they, they were huge collectors of art. Um, and there's these great photographs of, of Mrs. Bunshaft, like in full, like 60s, like beautiful, like just silk chantong and, right. and big updos, like standing in their, in their stairwell in their hallway with their Bertoyas. And it was very much, you know, you know, again, you think of like negative connotations of like deck arts objects, but they really were things that people wanted to, to see in their space, mm -hmm. everyday things mm -hmm. that were spectacular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why don't we do one, one, I apologize, because we are getting on to 4.30, so know, we're a little bit over. Really but I, and I, I am so grateful for you all for sticking with us this whole time. It's yeah. really wonderful. Mm -hmm. I, um, I'm, I, I'm going gonna, uh, I'm gonna to call on, on you, Michael, so go yes. ahead. Yes. Oh, hang on, wait for, wait for Lindsay just a yeah. second.
Yeah. <laughs> this is just a rare treat to be able to sort of have this opened up because mm -hmm. of your being here, um, Ms. Victoria. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, is, the, is it possible to visit the barn and the house? And are there still sculptures in it? Or uh, is that not, a, not, a, not an option? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, the barn still exists, and my brother Val Bertoya lives there. Uh, he still has 19 Harry Bertoya sculptures in the barn, and then he has added quite a number of his own tonal sculptures in the barn. Uh, I, he does do tours, but I noticed lately that he, do, he no longer has a website, so it's a little bit tricky to find him. Uh, you can contact me and I'll give you his email address. Uh, the, perhaps you know, the, the rest of the sculptures, we were trying to find a museum home for about 60 of them, but it was a challenging process between, you know, a, a museum buys a painting and you, all you need is four feet of space. <laughs> you buy 60 sculptures and you need the acoustics, you need the right room, you need people to play them and maintain them. Mm -hmm. So it was challenging and then COVID came and it became nearly impossible. So we did sell 20 of them at Sotheby's recently, just on the open market. Uh, I do understand that some went to museums. We haven't been told which museums yet. Uh, and the, the foundation board is deciding what to do with the remaining 40. Of course, we'd still like to have a museum home, but it's tough. So uh, I think it is possible to visit there, but it seems to become more challenging. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Celia and Marin, Olivia and Sydney. Thank you all so much for <laughs> for enlightening us with uh, about Harry Bertoya. And thank you all for spending your afternoon with us. Um, I, I hope you have enjoyed it. And I, I hope you spend more time in the galleries and, and, really, uh, and really get a, a good sense of Harry Bertoya's work and also Olivia Block's work. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.